Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I was given this title, and clearly one can argue, are patients actually eating earlier because they recover faster, or do they recover faster because they eat earlier? And the same could be said for early mobilization. So I don't know if I have the answer. Um, but maybe just a little bit about the history of the ERAS group, because I'm not going to use that famous slide, and that's why I'm probably not supposed to speak here. Um, this was not my brother, um, but I do apologize to the Spanish community for the orange team misbehaving during the World Championship final in 2010. I actually started in the ERAS group as a colorectal slash HPB surgeon and gradually moved into HPB. And that's what I'm going to do during this talk as well. So I'm actually a liver and pancreatic surgery a surgeon at the moment. As I was given the talk, I thought what I'll do is I'll look at systematic reviews and meta-analysis because all the other ones will have covered everything that has to do with creating conditions for early mobilization and feeding. But is there any evidence for these um, uh, for early feeding or early mobilization to actually enhance recovery. And this is a very recent systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials and semi or quasi-randomized trials. I don't know if everybody's familiar with the term quasi-randomization, but that actually means that you, for example, randomize based on the day a patient enters the hospital or date of birth or sex or whatever. It's not a, a very good way of randomization, but that's what they assembled and actually what they found that it, is that it was not possible to in, identify individual components that improved outcome. Isn't that disappointing? And did they look at the right things? Well, as far as my talk is concerned, they looked at the right things. They looked at early mobilization, removal of drains, blah, 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 blah. So they took all these things into account, and then they came up with the conclusion that over the whole of surgery, so also including thoracic surgery, um, hip replacements, etc. There was no evidence whatsoever for any of these uh, elements, mobilization and early feeding, to be crucial in outcome determination. So then you could also argue, well, they looked at too many different specialties. Maybe we should look a little bit more in depth at, say, colonic surgery, and that is what we did in the past. And I think Ulf Gustafsson already alluded to this trial. This was the LAFA trial. I was not a co-author, but I was involved in the study group because in the Netherlands, we usually do these randomized control trials, multi-center, everybody participates, and we all are assembled under a sort of collaborators group. Now, what they concluded was that enforced advancement of oral intake and early mobilization, laparoscopic surgery, and female sex were independent determinants of early outcome. If they were mobilized early and had early oral intake, it was termed the perfect protocol. So that was a term It was highly significant. Again, it's not about is a patient able to eat. It's about enforced mobilization and enforced intake. So it's not about just looking at when they start eating. You enforce them to mobilize. You enforce them to eat as soon as possible. And that's what you see. Then they sort of, it may have an, 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 uh, an effect on outcome. So as the ERAS group, we were interested in what the situation in Europe was at the start of this millennium. And this is an old slide, and it just looks at early, early oral intake at will of solid food. We know that that reduces starvation, it reduces gut paralysis, it uses, uh, reduces catabolism, you can take the drip down, you reduce the need of artificial nutrition. Lewis's team has done quite a bit of work on it, so probably you should feed them early, even if the evidence is not so robust. There is enough arguments to do so. Now, what was the situation in Europe? Um, this is Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Scotland. This is the Netherlands. We would wait until patients move their bowels or pass gas before we allow them to eat. So basically, we were not sort of following this uh, early oral intake in the past, and the same was true for other countries, probably due to the work of Henry Kielet, the Danish were a little bit ahead of uh, the time. Now this is about nasogastric tubes, one of my favorites, because it's very difficult to eat when you have a nasogastric tube. 
And this is about decompression tubes, and that's the sort of confusing thing, because in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, they were not using them as decompression tubes, but as feeding tubes. So the, please only look at the Dutch data, and you can see that we kept the nasogastric tube in for until they moved their bowels. Well, that's not probably a way of getting patients to, to eat early, is it? And it's also not a good way of getting people, uh, patients mobilized early. So we thought that it would be wise to maybe um, tackle this and change it. And we started with the implementation of the ERAS protocol in 2002 in my unit, which is down under in the Netherlands. And once we did that in 2002, we then obtained funding from the government to roll out the same protocol of early mobilization and early feeding in the rest of the Netherlands in 33 hospitals spread over the whole country. There's only 101 hospitals in the Netherlands. So we had about one third in three consecutive series. And please keep in mind the three series. They are not in the same year, but they all took a year. And what we did is we did exactly what we do here. We got all the people together with their team. We had all these lectures. And then we started them off saying, OK, you start in your hospital. And every three months, you come back and tell us how things evolve. And we do that during a year. And we'll just see what happens. And we also asked them, please look back two years ago what your data were on uh, length of stay, etc. So making early feeding possible. Take the energy tube out. No nausea and vomiting. There's patient factors in it, as has been explained. Surgeon factors, laparoscopic open anesthetic factors uh, explained all by the previous speakers. You can work on ileus, uh, chewing gum, avoiding opioids, alvimopan. Maybe you can add um, uh, reducing fluid uh, uh, to it. Um, but to allow pa patients to eat early, you must make it feasible. So this has been explained. I'll skip the slide. Um, making early mobilization possible requires that they are free of pain they have as few drains as possible, preferably no urinary catheter, no drips. Take the drip down on the first post-operative day and they will start eating and drinking because they are thirsty. And make sure they have no suppressed consciousness. And if you do that, you can early mobilize them and early feed them. Now this is the result of this structured implementation of an enhanced recovery program in the Netherlands. These were people with no prior experience in ERAS whatsoever. So they just started off from scratch. And they uh, achieved a reduction in length of stay mean. So that includes the effect of complications. Three days, median, uh, three days as well. So they achieved a length of stay of six days with no prior experience in ERAS. So it is possible to uh, take the nasal gastric tube out and it is possible to facilitate early oral intake after elective colonic surgery in the Netherlands. If we can do it, you can do it. Um, it's not so difficult. And so I think even if the evidence for early feeding and early mobilization is not so robust, uh, there is ample evidence that it's feasible and safe because we had no increasing complications. So I challenge you to start doing this. That's what the data, the first series, the first hospital series, the second hospital series, the third series, and then the total. And you can see that it's very simple to eradicate the use of nasogastric tubes in a country completely in one year's time. Um, normal food at will. On average, they were eating on day five in most of the hospitals. And we reduced that to day two, which is the mean. So most of the patients were eating earlier. You can also look at um, the situation in a more graphical way. And this is the proportion of patients that were eating. And what you see, if the curve shifts to the left, they start eating earlier. That's a simple thing. And this is the ERAS, the dashed line. This is the pre-ERAS, so the hist historical series. So you see that they start eating earlier. Half of them are eating on day two, whereas they were eating on day five, as I showed in the previous slide. You can also look at the effect, is it safe in ASA 1, 2, or 3, 4? You see the same thing happen. The curve shifts to the left. More patients are eating earlier, irrespective of their ASA classification, 
you can argue about is it safe in right-sided colonic resection or left-sided colonic resection. You can see the same, the curves overlap and they move to the left. So it's safe and feasible. And then the last issue about laparoscopic resection, Wolf Gustafsson alluded to that. You can also see that the curves shift to the left. They sort of overlap. Probably laparoscopic is doing slightly better, but they eat earlier and it's feasible and safe. We then did some statistics. I'm not a great fan of statistics, but they showed that mobilization was an independent predictor of length of stay. The drip stopped, the same. Laxative magnesium oxide, we used that. It has something to do with that as well. Laparoscopic surgery and some other demographic things which you cannot influence. So there's quite a bit to do. Now the next thing is, did nobody ever test the effect of early mobilization and early feeding versus not doing that? And this is an interesting study uh, looking at the comparison of early mobilization and diet in laparoscopic. So that's the next step. Are we going ahead with our uh, uh, developments? And what you see is that the early mobilization and diet after laparoscopic colonic surgery resulted in reduced recovery time without an increase in complications. So again, even if the evidence is low, it's safe and feasible, and you can argue, why would you on earth keep a patient fasted? Why would you not give them something to eat? Why would you not mobilize them? Why would you keep them in bed? There's no reason to do that. It's harmful to the patient. So maybe allow them to walk the dog um, and search for their own food. So again, coming back to the issue of uh, safety and feasibility, if you look at this systematic review by Lewis later uh, in 2009, he states there is no obvious advantage in keeping patients nil by mouth. This review supports the notion that early commencement of enteral, enteral feeding may be of benefit. So it all comes down to low evidence, but no reason to keep patients fasted, no reason to keep them in bed. So the next step is, is it feasible and safe to do that in colonic surgery? Laparoscopic open, I think that is answered. The answer is yes. The other question is, is it safe in other uh, surgical procedures? And this is just to challenge you a little bit more gastric cancer, safety and feasibility of early postoperative oral nutrition on the first postoperative day after gastrectomy for gastric cancer. And the answer is it's feasible and safe. So I think uh, Julie also alluded to uh, upper GI procedures. I think maybe the only reason not to feed early is esophageal resections. <clears throat> That's my personal. Uh, yeah. I'm going to work towards the end of my talk um, uh, moving into different fields. And what we did is, uh, because I like pioneering new areas, um, and that's one of my tasks in the ERAS group, looking at new fields and see if we can advance that. Um, and what you can, we asked in the uh, surgical community whether they had any experience with ERAS programs. And we sent out uh, a, a monkey survey sort of thingy. And what you can see is that there is quite a bit of experience worldwide in colonic surgery. It differs per country and region. Um, there is much less experience in liver surgery and virtually no experience in pancreatic surgery. This is uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, County Hospital. Um, it's a very, very good trial and I'm proud that we had in the British Journal of Surgery, of which I'm an editor, and it shows that you can actually use enhanced recovery programs following open liver resection um, as well. It's safe, feasible, it reduces uh, length of stay, and it also makes patients medically fit for discharge much earlier than using the standard care. It's about 100 patients randomized to two arms. Um, so is it feasible in liver surgery? The answer is yes. And it's probably simpler because there is no ileus. If you don't touch the gut, uh, there is much less of uh, an impact on, on uh, bowel function, although other factors may still work on uh, bowel mot motility. Now the next question is, is there an effect of enhanced recovery 
in laparoscopic liver resection. That has not yet been done as a randomized trial, but we are doing that trial at the moment. It will stop as per order of the Data Safety Monitoring Board on the 1st of July because of low accrual of patients. So I hope we'll have the results next year. Um, so again, back to the gastrectomy, um, just to show that if it's feasible in the liver, the next question is, is it feasible in, feasible in gastric surgery? And Lassen, Christopher Lassen has done this uh, beautiful trial in 2008 in Norway, and that showed that allowing patients to eat normal food at will from the first day after major upper GI surgery, including a few esophageal resections, does not increase morbidity compared with traditional care with nil by mouth and enteral feeding. So, also in upper GI surgery, there's probably no real argument, except maybe for esophageal surgery, to keep the patients fasted. Um, so, the significantly in favor, early feeding, uh, for, for in, in terms of major complications, length of stay, and post-discharge complications. Please read the trial. It's interesting to, uh, to have a look at this. Um, the next, and I always think it's the final challenge, uh, is uh, looking at the feasibility and safety of this early feeding in pancreatic surgery. And actually, to be honest, I'm very worried about uh, what we may encounter there. I do think it's feasible, but it may be that there are problems because, for example, a recent trial on a simple question as drain versus no drain has been stopped in the United States, the Van Buren trial, because of increased mortality in the no drain arm. I don't know if that is uh, to be extrapolated to uh, all other randomized trials that are currently ongoing, as one in Germany, one in the Netherlands, but it certainly is a worry and we need to be very careful that we do not just replace one dogma by the other. So it may be the case that in pancreatic surgery, for example, you do not need a drain in every patient, but then we need to find out which patients do need a drain as an early detector of complications and which patients do not. Um, we do know that fast-track program, uh, programs after pancreatic adudinectomy reduce delayed gastric emptying. I've been feeding patients early. I started using jejunostomy feeding tubes uh, in, in the past, in 2000, in pancreatic surgery. We stopped that altogether and feed them early. We have good results, but again, it's, it's a matter of looking at soft pancreases, narrow ducts, etc. cetera. And, uh, so I don't sort of invite people to just randomly do this. Thank you. <laughs>